It's 10 o'clock, which is our start time. And I am all one for promptness. So I'm going to get ahead and go ahead and get started. Um, I think that our trusty technical assistant is going to be changing something about the way that you see me. So we'll just rely on her to do that. Um, my name is Lydia Jane Failing. I am on the Unitarian Universalist Fellowships uh, San Miguel de Allende care team. And as a member of the care team, we regularly pr um, produce workshops for our UU members. And these are um, topics of general interest related to health and well being. And back in March, we had um, set up, a, developed a workshop, which we called um, Preparing for a Thoughtful Death. And uh, we had a series of speakers set up. This is gonna be a one day workshop at the Hotel Quinta Loretto. And right the week before March 21st was when the, we got all of the notifications about COVID-19. So we had to cancel that workshop. Sadly, we were very disappointed, but we knew it was the right thing to do. But we had so much interest in it that we decided to, once we had our Zoom protocol set up, and our UU community has been using that a lot, we realized that we would be able to offer this same workshop um, and maybe make it even a little easier and available to more people because we don't have to go anywhere and we could get speakers who, you know, um, potentially wouldn't be available. So we decided to go ahead and set it up this way. So there will be a series of workshops, one a week for the next several weeks. Right now I've got either five or six speakers lined up. It will be a different topic every week. Um, but I do want to make quite clear that this workshop is not related to the COVID-19 situation. We are not, we are not going to be talking about the virus. Um, and I keep referring back to UU because for those of you in UU that don't know, we put this workshop out on the civil list. So there are um, maybe about half of the attendants did not sign up from UU. So we've got a lot of non-UU people um, with us today. Um, but we're not, we're not talking about the virus. This was set up before the, vi I mean, not certainly before people knew about the virus, but before we went into lockdown. We've got our um, San Miguel Task Force, which has been incredibly efficient in constantly giving us updates on information. So that's not something that we're, that we're going to be talking about here. So if that's what you were wanting to hear about, please feel free to just check out because that's, that's not what we're doing. Um, there naturally will be, we will be touching on things related to, we will have some practical information about uh, what happens when you die in Mexico. Um, but that was the same information that we had before we had to cancel it before. So this is going to be a much broader um, topic of discussion. And we're, we're hoping to get you thinking about things um, in a way that perhaps you've never thought about them before, about how to get ready for our final transition. Um, let's go into a little bit of etiquette about the meeting. We will have uh, about 75 people signed up for the meeting. Um, I don't know how many have actually are participating, but that's a lot of people. So we decided to um, set it up so that everyone is muted all of the time. We don't want any background noise. We don't want dogs barking or you know truck traffic or anything. So everyone will be muted. When you have a question, we would like for you to open the chat box. At the bottom of your screen, there is a, um, a number of icons, one of which is chat. And if you click on chat, it will open up a box on the right hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. So because we have such a large group, we're going to limit the use of the chat box to only questions, not casual comments or I love that or yeah, my sister did this or whatever. It's only going to be questions. And uh, Wilka 
will talk for a certain period of time and we will be mindful of the chat box. And when we see that there are sufficient questions for us to stop and answer those questions, we will do that at that point. So I'm not going to say that it's gonna be 15 or 20 or 30 minutes. It's gonna be when, we, when there are enough questions that Wilka feels like, okay, this is time, let's answer the questions, we'll do that. And hopefully we'll have all of everyone's questions answered before the end of the workshop at 11.30. Let's see what else have we got. So we've given you the information for making your donations in the chat box. Um, I had originally said, um, we'd like donations of 100 pesos, but I've since found out that PayPal is the easiest way to do that. Um, I'm hesitant to ask people to put such a small donation on a credit card. So if you have PayPal, please use that. If you don't, don't worry about it. You can pay it forward another way. PayPal only accepts dollars. So the, the closest equivalent to 100 pesos is $5. So we would really appreciate that donation. It will go towards the Unitarian Universalist Minister's Discretionary Fund, which is a fund that we have available for, for people who are in dire need of food, uh, home, perhaps medical expenses. Um, again, this is not for the general public for food for people during the COVID situation. This is very specific. We are, we are very focused on what the fund is for. Um, and additionally, a percentage of the fund will go to the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation for their participation in the workshop. For the next workshop, next week on June the 3rd, we will not be doing registration for that workshop. It's way too much trouble to keep track of so many emails. What we will do is Diana, the day before the workshop, will send an email link like the one you got for this workshop to everyone who has signed up. All 75 people will get the link. So if you wanna participate, all you have to do is click on that link and sign up. Because if you register, we gotta keep track of it and we gotta answer and then, you know, it's, it's way too much trouble. So it's far easier just to send the link. And please feel free, if you have friends that are interested, share the link with anyone, you know, we're, I think we could have, I don't know, a couple hundred people, um, you know, our Zoom account allows for that. So please feel free to share it, but just know that we're not going to be publicizing it the way we did this first one. Um, that turned out to be a whole lot more work and trouble than we expected it to be, which means we have a great turnout, which is good, um, but we're not going to keep doing that. So if you have any questions about that, just post them into the chat box. But basically, just look in your, e in your email box and you will see a link before next Wednesday's meeting. Okay, so let me introduce Wilka. I first met Wilka a couple of years ago when I attended one of her Death Cafe sessions. Um, and it was very interesting and it made me aware of a lot of the work that is being done on the process of death and dying, um, not only in the United States, but internationally. It's a topic that's been of interest to me for many years. I have no idea why, I, I don't know where it came from. Probably something in a past life, I suspect. But um, I then, I, so I stayed in touch with Wilka and it became apparent that we have interest in a lot of different things. Um, she's a death doula. She is the president of the Kubler-Ross Foundation. Um, She's a certified death doula, and she has an extensive list of very impressive credentials on death and dying. I went to one of the workshops that the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation um, had, I think it was last year, and got so much out of it, it was really impressive, which was one of the things that encouraged me to set this workshop up for our community. So Wilka today is going to be giving us an overview of the entire workshop series. She'll be telling you about the speakers and what their topics will be. We will go over this again every week for the following week, but this is going to give you a general idea of what does preparing for a thoughtful death mean? What does it mean spiritually, emotionally, legally, practically? What does it mean in many different areas? And then the the follow-up workshops will be focusing on more specific aspects of the general overview umbrella. So um, I am, this is my part as a moderator, and I now turn the workshop over to 
Wilka, and I think we can look forward to a very, very interesting um, period of learning and giving you the opportunity to ask the questions that you want to have answered about a thoughtful death. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia Jane. Um, I am so uh, honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and I, I think it's just lovely to see all of your faces, um, some of you whom I know, some of you who I've seen. Um, it's a great feeling of community that, um, that it's just wonderful. Um, so let me see if I can change my view. I, I'm not sure. Um, I would like to see your faces. Yeah, here we go. I hope that's okay, um, rather than to see myself. <laughs> um, but you could change your view to speaker view on the right top right corner if you want to see me more than everybody else. Um, so I'll start with just a little um, sort of background about what I do and, and why this is important to me. Um, first of all, as a person who is going to die, it, all of these topics are important to me. Uh, as a transpersonal psychologist, I understood um, early on that we are always, uh, whether it's conscious or unconscious, we're always preparing for a thoughtful death, for a peaceful death, um, in our own uh, longings to find peace in our life and to live our life more fully. And those two things come together and are related. And it was very clear to me as I was working with clients that this is what we are doing all the time. Um, we are working on ourselves. We are trying to resolve whatever doesn't feel at peace in ourselves so that we can be present in our lives. And this is exactly the same work that leads us to have a peaceful, thoughtful, good death um, as we are preparing for it in the end. Um, and so the way that I look at it from being a person who is going to die, from being a transpersonal psychologist and a death doula, um, we are always uh, preparing for life and death. Um, and so um, you might wonder what a death doula is. And so a death doula is really, how can I say it? It's something that has been developed in the recent past, maybe 25 years. Uh, but really it's something that comes from our ancestors. Before we had any of the systems that we now have in place to take care of our, our being born and are dying and you know are tending through illness and transitions uh, we were taking care of our birthing and our dying in community and in, in families and so a death doula is a companion and an advocate um, and someone who is tending to not just the person who is going through that process whether it's birthing or dying but those around the person so uh, close loved ones, uh, family members. And so the death doula, which as I said, is just a term that has been defined in the last maybe 25 years and that now becomes one of the roles that we play in uh, tending to end of life or to um, terminal illness uh, or to birth. There's birth doulas as well. Um, it's just one name because everyone, I think at least three of the people who are going to be presenting in this series do the work of death doula and perhaps are not named that, but, um, but it's all the same work. And so what we do is that we tend to the physical, the mental, the social, the emotional, and the spiritual aspects of the process. And that's what I'll be presenting to you today um, within the context of our series as well. Um, and I also just want to tell you a little bit about the foundation, um, the Elizabeth Cooler Ross Foundation, with, which has its uh, main headquarters in the United States, run by Elizabeth Cooler Ross's son, Ken Ross, um, is, has branches across the world, and we are um, all inspired by the work of Elizabeth Cooler Ross, who was a psychiatrist and a humanitarian, and she, along with Cicely Sanders, started the hospice movement. Um, a, and our main mission is to contribute to evolving our death culture so that we can bring back humanity and dignity to our um, losses, our grief, our dying, and everything that happens after death. Um, 
So one of the things that we're doing in San Miguel right now is that we offer um, free pro bono and sliding scale or by donation services online, on the phone, and in person uh, to accompany anyone through any of the difficulties of any kind of loss and um, any kind of uh, facing illness and everything that goes with that, anything to do with preparing for death and accompanying the dying through their process. Um, so uh, the donations that come to us are so that we can have equipment, proper equipment to be able to accompany people in person. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that these services are available to you free of charge or by donation or whatever is possible for you. Our interest is that we can tend to our community. Um, and so I also wanted to tell you that as you have questions, um, I will be keeping an eye on that and I love to be able to dialogue, but because as Lydia Jane said, there's so many people, we will handle it by chat, but it helps me to know what you need to know so that I can just adapt what I'm talking about, um, you know, to, to your concerns. And so I see that already there's something in the box. So I'm, let me just check before we get going. Um, it's all about the donations. Okay. <laughs> um, well, the, the death doula uh, movement uh, has been most predominant in Canada and the United States. And even to this day, after 25 years, there's not a lot of involvement. I mean, there's, it's still not considered uh, an essential part of uh, the process of dying. And they're beginning to be part of hospice teams and some hospitals are starting to have death doulas in their staff. Um, and in dying at home, people who are more uh, interested in doing home uh, care and home funerals and all of this are also more uh, informed about death doulas. And so death doulas are working in those areas. In Mexico right now, the, the Elizabeth Kula Ross Foundation is starting the first ever uh, training course on death doula work. Uh, and it's happening right now. And so uh, for, the, for a long time, I was the only certified death doula. I know that other people are doing this work, like Wendy, who will be presenting next week. A lot of the work that she does is, is what now is under the umbrella of death doula, but um, Wendy's work goes beyond uh, the death doula work as well. And so, um, regardless of whether you would wanna work with a death doula, <laughs> This is the kind of things that a death doula can help you, but this is what we're trying to share with you in this, in this presentation, is what are the different things that you need to consider to prepare for a thoughtful death so that you can be at peace as you um, come nearer that time in your, in your life. Um, and so the way we like to look at it is that, you know, when we think about preparing for death, usually we're thinking about the practical things, the most tangible things, and that makes sense, right? Um, so we're thinking about, okay, what's going to happen to my body? That's usually one of the first questions. Another one of the first questions that we have is how can I die without pain? Um, uh, you know, there's those physical concerns that are our first, the, the, where we first go to, right? So maybe we'll think about uh, a will and what we want our things, you know, have to happen to our things, um, but there's, there's a lot more that, that goes into preparing for our dying. And a really important aspect of this that I stress and reiterate is that the more that we are conscious about it, the more we release and let go of the things that are not important in life. And then the more we can be present with our lives and live fully until that time comes of, of death. Um, so, so conscious intentional pre preparation or end of life planning happens the moment you become aware of it and it could be at any age. We don't have to have a diagnosis or be 80 years old and start to think, well, you know, it must be time soon, so I better prepare, but we can start that preparation anytime and there's nothing morbid about it. As I say, um, really, it just allows us to work through all of the things that keep us from being fully at peace. If you think about what keeps you up at night, those things that don't let you just fully rest, they're the same things that get in the way when we are in the process of dying and make it a lot more 
challenging potentially to let go into the process of dying and having a, a less um, really agonizing. I mean, I, I think that death doesn't have to be agonizing at all. And I have witnessed many that are not. So, so I know that we can be at peace with many things and allow ourselves to flow into whatever process of dying. Um, but let's go back to our reality today, which is that, you know, if there are things that worry you, that give you anxiety, that, you know, make you lose your sleep or your appetite or any of those things, those are the things to tend to in the mental aspect, in the emotional, social aspect, in the spiritual aspect. Most of the things that keep us awake maybe are not of the physical realm, but maybe they are. Um, so, um, so I'm going to go through a little bit of each of the, the areas. So when we think about physical, we are concerned with being comfortable, being out of pain, um, not suffering. Uh, we consider um, what do we want to do? What, want, what do we want to happen with our remains? Do we want to have a funeral? Um, these kinds of things. And of course, all of these things are important to consider. Um, so I think uh, maybe I will talk a little bit more about that later and um, maybe Wendy will touch upon that and, and Pepe, um, Dr. Pepe. And, um, <laughs> but there's more to the, the physical planning that we can think about. And it has to do with, and this is one of our priorities, uh, those of us who are death activists, is to how do we make sure that we have dignity and humanity in those processes at the end of life? And so one of the things that you're probably familiar with um, is uh, your uh, pos possibly your advanced directives and uh, you know out thinking about and outlining all of the things that you would want and not want in the case that you are not able to make decisions for yourself when you're in a time of of distress and being close to death. Um, but there's also an ethical will, I don't know if you've heard of that, where you can actually um, lay out what are the, um, the things that you believe in that you want to have honored through your own process and after. So it's a little bit of what you leave behind as much as it is, you know, the, how do you say it? Like, um, what supports your decision making uh, through your end of life process? And so, let me see. I see a little, a few questions. So I'll look and see if there's anything. I think this is about a uh, reception. Okay. All right. So let's move on. So, um, okay. So. I think I'm just going to maybe navigate a little bit around all of the, the topics because one of the things that is really important for us to consider, um, if we look at it from the position of what, we, what makes us lose sleep at night, um, is the things that are unfinished. And this, it will touch upon our mental, our social, our emotional, and our spiritual aspects of preparing for end of life. So there are um, a variety of things that are important and that I recommend that you consider. And this is one of the things that a death doula can do, but it's something that you can do. And today I'm going to go over it a little bit. So maybe you want to take notes and then maybe you want to think about it a little bit more later on, um, is to think about and do a little bit of a life review. Um, this is something that happens at the end of life usually when we are nearing the end and we are aware of it and we are conscious, we begin to consider how did we live our life? Did we live a good life? What are our regrets? Um, you know, what feels unfinished? Um, what do we feel guilty about? Is there still shame? Are there histories of humiliation? And is there, you know, all of these things that feel unfinished? And so one of the things that we recommend, that I recommend, is that we look closely at those when they come up. And so one of the beautiful things about being alive is that these things come up all the time. So we don't have to wait until the end and then try to do all the work at once. Maybe today there's one thing that, brings, that comes up about a regret that we have. And so we tend to it today instead of waiting until the end. And we can work with, you know, you know, what about it is that we feel regretful? 
what would we have preferred to do? Um, and then perhaps take actions that will help to um, soothe the discomfort around that regret. Um, but often coming to a place of acceptance with the way things were is all that we need to do. But, you know, of course we can't force that. <laughs> it's a process that takes some time sometimes that um, we can't just say, okay, I'm gonna go from feeling uncomfortable to accepting this and forcing ourselves to accept it if we're not ready to accept it. So one of the things that this process uh, requires is that we allow ourselves to feel uncomfortable. And these are all the things that we're constantly avoiding, right? Because we wanna just feel okay, but this is the work that either we do it now or we do it at the end. We can't get away with not doing it. Um, and in my experience, uh, that has been the case. Um, whether I'm working with someone who is young and interested in just working through their things, or if I'm working with an older person who just wants to have a clean slate and be at peace, or if I'm working with someone who is five days from death. Um, the work is the same. And so it's up to us to choose to do it sort of in small doses when we're, you know, we feel we have more time, when we have support, when we're intentionally doing it comfortably and we can get support. Um, or we are gonna do it uh, <laughs> near the end. Um, and so, and one of the things that I've observed and uh, maybe my colleagues will affirm this later, is that when we haven't done any of it, it comes up. And that's the work of a doula as well. We are there to help all of this come up and out and be expressed in some way, be resolved. Um, and sometimes the work involves family members. Sometimes the work is done through family members because, you know, the patient is um, no longer, doesn't have as much energy or is unable to speak, but we, we have to do the work anyway. And it usually happens, at least in my experience, that it's not until there is a release or a relief that comes from this kind of process that the patient is able to die peacefully, whether they're doing the work or whether their family member who is there is doing the work. And so this is very interesting to me and, and to me is very valid and necessary that we do this work. And so my invitation to you is that we do it now. <laughs> um, and that we do it with time and that we can take breaks and rest and you know cry if we need to, get angry if we need to, you know, write letters that we burn and never send or whatever it is that we need to do. And in the, in the case that we have the opportunity to make amends, we can try to do that, uh, you know, but also gauging whether it's more, whether it's going to, I mean, there's two things. When we're talking about making amends, we can decide to try to make amends with a living person. We can make amends with a person who is dead and we can choose to make amends in ourselves with those people, whether they're alive or dead, and not involve them. And all of those are perfectly valid and they work, okay? As long as we come to that place of release and peace in ourselves. So going back to what keeps us up at night, we have regrets and then we have unfinished business. So we think about all of the places where we feel not complete. I mean, and they could be things that we wanted to do that we never got to do. Um, they could be um, relationships that stayed up in the air that need some kind of making sense um, or any other uh, thing that feels unfinished. And the process is similar. We have to feel our feelings about it, which probably the reason why it's still unfinished is because we didn't want to or couldn't have our feelings when the thing happened, whatever it was. Um, and then, um, I kind of lost my train of thought, but and then we have um, guilt. What are the things that we feel guilty about? Some things we might regret and not feel guilty about. And then there are some things that are further burdened by guilt. And so looking into our guilt is also really important because it really, really weighs us down and um, we need to come to a place, an opening, a place of opening where we can forgive ourselves or others. And the, okay, the topic or the term forgiveness can be a tricky one. Um, we look at forgiveness from a place of, again, where do I feel resolved with whatever it is that I'm dealing with? 
it's not about condoning behaviors that are not acceptable or that are abusive or that you know are traumatic nothing like that we are not here to um accept the unacceptable but to come to terms with and one of the ways that we can come to terms with things that happened to us that we had no control over that really really hurt us is to see how did that become part of or fuel for the person that the fulfilling our own potential and finding ways to make meaning of it from a point of view of how we have grown and how we have transformed from all of the, the challenges in life. And um, one of the things that I also find really important to consider is that as I have seen it and experienced it personally and with my patients and clients, is that every loss that we go through and survive is an invitation to um, go deeper into our personal growth and our evolution. Um, it's a way of getting to know ourselves better. It's a way of understanding humanity better. It's a way of opening our hearts more and coming to a place of um, unconditional love and appreciation for our human condition. Um, and so the, in a way, losses and death is here always to push us to a new level of um, presence with ourselves and others. Um, and as Elizabeth Kubler Ross said, that the one thing that we are here to do is to learn unconditional love. And some of us can do it, as I said, from now until the end, and some of us will get to that at the end. And in my very limited experience, um, it really does feel that way, that when we get to the end, it, there is that sort of release that allows us to um, connect with that unconditional love. Um, I sort of, again, went on a tangent, but <laughs> uh, so going back to, um, right, to, to losses and to transform and where are the opportunities for growth and if we look at life in this way because none of us can can go through life without some kind of loss um, some losses are really small some losses cause a lot of anxiety even though they don't appear to be such a big deal and then some really big ones really trans, you know devastate us and our lives and some that are really big actually which we think should devastate us don't but regardless in a way, we're going through the, this process of loss and growth and loss and growth. And so the way we like to look at the, the process of grief, which is a very important process that some of us have to repress for different reasons, whether it's you know the way our family works or how the way society works that requires that we be functional and not have our feelings. Um, that process of grief is a really important one because that is the one through which we come into contact with what needs to change, where am I ready to grow, um, you know, what are the things that have to I have to release, um, and what relationships I have to um, deepen, what, how do my priorities need to change? When we think about death and dying, and when we think about the losses that we've already suffered, we realize that with each one of them, there has been a change in priorities, a real shift in priorities. And, you know, not that we're talking about the pandemic, but right now when we are faced with all of these changes and all of these limitations and all of this very evident death, um, a lot of us are beginning to really shift our priorities. What does it, what really matters? And this is another question that we ask ourselves, either whether it's at the end of life or in the process of preparation for the end of life at any age is, what really matters? What is really important? What is my heart calling to? You know, where do I want to dedicate my time, my focus, my energy? You know, what is going to be meaningful? And maybe when we're just going about our lives without thinking about it, we're not really thinking about it and we are compromising a lot. Um, you know, if we thought, okay, I'm dying tomorrow. It's a fact. I'm going to die tomorrow. Am I going to 
you know, scrub the toilet? Or am I going to uh, talk to my loved ones? Or am I going to go into nature? You know, we, we think about it a little bit differently. You know, sometimes I can speak for myself. I was, I was brought up as somebody, you know, as a, from being a child on that all the chores had to be done. All the homework had to be done before I could do whatever it is that I wanted. I couldn't play or listen to music or anything until I got all my chores done. So over the course of my life, I spent many, many years never doing anything that I wanted to do because there's always so much stuff that we have to do, you know, like we can't go without cleaning the house or we can't go without, uh, you know, all of these things like, you know, cleaning the yard. I mean, of course we want to do those things and they give us pleasure, but when we need to consider what is really meaningful to me and how can I shift my priorities to make sure that if today is my last day, I lived it well. Um, and so this is also an invitation that we, I would offer and the foundation would also offer to you, which is to think about it that way. Today, have I lived my life fully? Today, do I have any regrets? Today, do I feel ashamed about anything? Today, um, does anything feel unfinished? Um, today, did I have fear and about what? And so this is the other thing. We look at what are the things that provoke fear and anxiety in us on a regular basis? You know, like I lose my phone and then I get really anxious and freaked out because why? Why? So then we begin to consider, okay, so what is that really about? And if we look deeper using the example of losing my phone, um, it's about, for me, a lack of being able to connect, right? Right now, we really need to connect with people somehow. And if my computer's not working and if my phone's not working, maybe I'm going to have great anxiety. But really that speaks to me about something that's important to me, right? So we can look at when we feel fear and anxiety, what is it telling me about what matters to me? And what is it telling me about what my priorities should be? I don't wanna wait until I lose my phone to realize that I never had that important conversation with my mother or with my sister or whatever, right? So if we do this review on a regular basis, we're gonna be great. <laughs> if the time comes, when the time comes, we don't have to have as much accumulated to work on at the very end. Um, so let me see if there's any questions. Mm, no, you're talking about reception, okay. <laughs> All right. Are there any questions? Anyone want to type in any questions for now? All right. So um, let me see. So so then, the, okay. So then we also have to think about the social aspects in a different context, not so much about our personal relationships, but our relationship to our community and what we leave behind. And I think this is something that um, can offer a lot of comfort for us when we are contemplating our non-existence. Um, the fact that one day we will not be here and the fact that um, life really truly is a very small uh, slice of time and that within that time maybe we would have achieved everything we thought or hoped that we would achieve, achieve but maybe not. And so when we think about the end of life and preparing for our end of life, again, it doesn't matter what, when, and it doesn't matter how old you are, um, we think about legacy and what we leave behind what of meaning do we leave behind and so again we 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 can do a life review and think about all of the positive um effect that we had on people on institutions on in the field that we worked in in our families and we, i mean we could really go deeply into that process or not but if we do, we will also find themes of how we have been able to contribute. Often we forget all of the great things that we have already done, that we don't need to think about all the things that we have left to do, um, but actually um, realizing, truly deeply realizing that we have already done so much, that the fact that we are alive today 
um, is, uh, is a testament and that the, who we are today is a testament to that. Um, but we could do a, a really detailed review and we could even make lists or, or drawings uh, about the different things um, that we have done to contribute to a better world, to a better person. Somebody once said in one of my death cafes that um, we may not be able to change the world, but we may, we may be able to uh, do a positive contribution to the world of one. And I love that because if we think about it that way, uh, how many worlds of one have we been able to positively influence and contribute to? Um, and so this is a very, very valuable exercise to do that I really highly recommend because sometimes we are so in this moment with whatever our conditions and whatever our limitations and we forget that we have really lived fuller lives than we were aware of. And we really have made a difference in ways that could be judged by some as small, but mm -mm, no gesture um, is so so small and so um so this this exercise is beautiful because it allows us to have greater appreciation for ourselves greater appreciation for our lives because there's sort of a, gen a, a generally there's a more mm, what is there's a tendency to remember all of the bad things <laughs> you know to remember all of the difficult things to remember all of the pain and suffering that either we lived or we caused right? Um, and we forget about the, the beautiful things. And this is actually not anybody's fault. Our brains are wired that way because, you know, the brain is trying to make us survive and they want, wants us to avoid more suffering. But so it's a very um, constructive and um, beautiful exercise to think about how have, have we contributed in a positive way to um, our context. Um, and then the other thing that we can think about, which Felicitas, which she will be talking um, later on in the series, um, is what are we leaving behind for our communities? And so um, what are we leaving behind to our families? But how are we also contributing in a larger way to the future generations? And one of the most tangible ways uh, to think about this is what we're going to do with our remains. And so I invite you to consider that and to think about that. And we will probably talk about later in the, in the series about what are our options for um, handling remains and uh, how we can also contribute to our environment um, so that there is an earth, a healthy earth for our future generations. Um, but you can think about in all of the different ways that your end of life can impact the future. Um, and we can, you know, we need a little more education. And I believe that perhaps Wendy and Pepe and Felicitas will talk more to us about that. Um, what are the implications and what is the impact of the different options that we have, both in medical care and in post-death care? Um, you know, one of the things that the foundation is really working on uh, becoming informed about so that we could implement in Mexico is the home funeral. Um, and perhaps Wendy has some experience with that and she might share with us next week, next week. Um, uh, but this is a very possible thing for us. And you might wonder, you know, what that might feel like, but I will tell you this. For those of us who survive any loss, um, there is something that happens physiologically when we witness dying and death, when this body witnesses another body going through that process, or when this body witnesses a body that has lost life. There's something chemical that happens. There is something physiological, biological that happens that allows for a smoother transition into the loss and the process of grief. Um, it is more natural and it is more healthy if we feel comfortable, of course. We're not gonna force ourselves to do something that really is not comfortable to us. But when we have the option of tending to a body and to being present with it, it really helps with the adjustment. A lot of the suffering that comes from grief is physiological. 
there is a withdrawal, like a chemical hormonal withdrawal of the physical loss. And when we have that experience with a body, we have an opportunity to sort of ease into that loss. Um, and so, you know, this is one of the conversations that may feel a little bit daunting to have and, and things to contemplate, but this is part of what our process is when we're preparing for a thoughtful death. We have to touch into those, you know, spaces and places in our thinking and in ourselves and in our bodies about, I really don't want to think about what's going to happen to my body after I die. You know, so if we feel that way to like allow ourselves to feel the discomfort of that and to allow ourselves to have the fear around that and then see what else is there. Um, you know, the, found, the people at the foundation, our, our team and volunteers are ready to help you with that if, if it comes up and you want some support. Um, but these are things that are best not put aside. These are all topics that are best faced and you know, work through and whatever emotions come and sensations come to sit with them and work through them rather than avoid them. You know, it is my personal view based on experience, as I said before, that those who have not allowed themselves the opportunity to have those experiences now, have them all intensely in a short amount of time before death. And so I invite you to work on it at your pace now and with the support that is available so that you don't have to suffer at all at the end. And it's not really suffering, but when it's all at once, it can be a lot and it can be very overwhelming. Um, so, so again, there's, there's not enough uh, reiteration that I could do about this. I invite you to start this work today. <laughs> um, so let me see what's going on here in the comments. Um. Uh, Wilka, there's one question about an ethical will. I've been screening them, and so far that's the one that's come up. How does one do an ethical will? Thank you, yeah. Francoise. Mm -hmm. So, well, I also want to thank you, Lydia Jane. I want to just uh, acknowledge that Andrea will be speaking about legacy also in a few weeks. I was not aware of that, so this is wonderful for us to know. Um, so we will have a conversation about that more, more deeply in a few weeks. Um, so doing an ethical will, there are formats that are available where you can begin to think about how to do it. Um, I have formats, the, the foundation has formats that we can provide to you if you're interested, and I'll make a note of that, that we can maybe send to you with the next uh, link uh, that we're going to send. Maybe Wendy also has a format. I don't know, Wendy, do you have a format? Um, okay, so anyway, in any case, uh, we, there, are, there are guidelines, let's say, of how to um, ask yourself questions and contemplate different things so that you can make that happen. And so an ethical will doesn't have to be, I don't know, actually, I need to ask that question about whether it needs to be legalized in Mexico um, to have an ethical will or if it's just a document that you share with your family and loved ones. Um, I will have to get back to you on that. And um, yeah, you know, one little fact that you probably already know about the advanced directives is that you definitely have to have a legal notarized document in Mexico and that you need to carry it with you at all times. Most people won't tell you that, but you know, those of us who are in San Miguel, are, are lucky because in our little bubble, um, we have very um, close ties with all of the systems that take care of us at the end of life. But if you are somewhere else in Mexico, it may not be as um, accessible that, that all of the support that you need to have your wishes fulfilled is there. And so uh, the best thing to do is to always have it with you because if you don't have it, they won't ask about it, it you know, in other states or in other places. And so, um, this is something that is that is important to consider. Um, my colleagues in hospital care, you know, say that they're trained to just save lives. They're not trained to ask about a, a, an advanced directive and, you know, wait to figure out where it is and who it is and, you know, to do anything. They're going to do everything that they're trained to do to save a life. Um, 
Let's see. Somebody is asking, hold on. Um, let's see, how many days are you allowed to keep the body of a deceased loved one in your house before the body goes to the funeral home? So I think this varies from uh, state to state. And here in San Miguel, um, again, because we have a very close knit uh, circle of who is uh, ad administering all of this and who is handling all of this, um, there's, there's a little leeway around what the numbers are and what the hours are. And so um, the, the first sort of window of freedom that we have is that we don't have to call in anybody for really as long as we need. Um, so often when we have um, a death, uh, because we don't know and we haven't thought about it, of course, none of you, because now you're all thinking about it, but you know, those who, who didn't think about it get into a frenzy and then the first thing they do is they call their doctor or they call their, their funeral home or they call the 24 hour uh, people. Um, and then there's this kind of tornado of, of things that happen and the next thing you know, you're, you come back to and realize that it's all happened and that you had no time to be with what is happening. And I really don't recommend that. I, I you know, if, unless you really just want it to be like that, I recommend that you pause at that moment and then just try to sit with what is happening and what is coming up for you or, and those, of, those who are with you um, before doing anything and before deciding to call anyone. Um, you can talk in advance with your doctor about you know, how long um, you have to call. Um, when I'm working with uh, my, the doctors that I work with, um, I just let him know the time of death but we don't call anyone in and he won't call anyone either and we'll just take the time that we need. Um, I believe that we have, um, you know, I, I can't remember the exact numbers right now, but, but technically once we call, we still have a number of hours. Um, so the first window of time is the time that you have the most control over, which is when you decide to report it and get the whole system moving. Um, once you get the system move, moving, there's a smaller window of time that you have for the rest of it. Um, so at least that's a very, um, it's a little overview to just address the question. And I'm sure that Wendy and Pepe will go deeper into um, those details. Um, are there forms for guilt for guiding uh, reflections on guilt and shame, regret, and reconnection with others. Um, there are not that I'm aware of. I, I facilitate that and those in my team for the Elizabeth Gula Ross Foundation do. Um, there are books that you can refer to that can help with the process of working through unfinished business and guilt and shame. Um, of course, there's tons of resources about working with those things individually, right? Like there's like whole libraries about how to work with your shame and how to work with your guilt um, in relation to end of life. I mean, and it's all, it all serves the same purpose. Um, in relation to end of life that I'm aware of, there is no book, but maybe some of our colleagues might tell us later, but a book that is really helpful in that preparation is called A Year to Live, and some of you are familiar with that. It's a book by Stephen Levine, um, and he who worked with many and, uh, patients at the end of life observed certain things that come up when, when we are getting ready to die. Um, and so that book, what it does is taking the premise of, uh, let's pretend that we just got a, a diagnosis, a terminal diagnosis, and let's go through the process of what someone who, who in real life does have a terminal diagnosis, what they go through, right? So they look at their regrets, they look at their relationships, they do a life review. Um, um, and so anyway, so that book is a, a, a helpful tool. And, um, you know, I will make myself a note to think about a, a putting together a, a little sort of worksheet about it for 
um, working with guilt and shame and regret. Um, I love that. I love having homework. Um, so uh, let me write this down. All right. So let's see, how are we doing? Um, so then there's the question of our spiritual concerns. And um, this is, you know, this word again, there are some words that fail us. Like I said, to, I think that forgiveness can be a tricky one. Uh, spirituality can be a tricky one as well. Um, because we, there are so many associations with spirit, with the words that they might cause the resistance for some, especially, um, honoring those who don't consider themselves spiritual. Um, what I have observed is, you know, for lack of a better word, that, um, the process of dying has an element of, the mystical. I mean, I, I, I don't know what are the words, the correct words, and I apologize that I don't have better words to, to express. There is something that is not really articulatable <laughs> about the experience of dying. And this is something that we go through, those of us who are there holding the space and, and supporting the person who is dying and the person who is dying uh, themselves, uh, that there is something of an otherworldliness about it. There is something, uh, you, you know, it's, there are no words for it, but there is something about it that, you know, we could call it spiritual, we could call it supernatural, we could call it magical, um, but there is something really quite amazing that is happening in that process of, of dying. Um, and this is not something that we talk about because the problem of words because of the problem of not being objective and, and um, you know, scientific about it. But there needs to be room for that which is not explainable in when we work with end of life. Um, and if you have been uh, with someone at their end of life, you know what I'm talking about. There are so many things that we cannot explain. And there are some things that just seem out of this world. Um, and there is a process that each person goes through that guides us and teaches us when we are there with a dying person. So there is um, some way of um, a human connection that is beyond anything that we've experienced in other contexts. Um, there is something of a sacred space, again, for lack of a better term, and that is something that our colleague Carlos will be talking about, that, that timeless, spaceless place of grief and dying. Um, there is, and I think, you, you know, if you've had uh, deep grief, you might also know what I'm talking about. There is something that is not linear about these experiences. Um, it, it feels like, you know, there is no time and, and that things kind of connect in very unusual ways. It's almost like a dream state, maybe. Um, and so there is that whole component of end of life that is actually um, where we can find uh, great confidence. And um, you know, this might sound really strange, but being somebody who has accompanied the dying, uh, I recommend it highly, unless of course this is something that is really truly difficult or uncomfortable for you because we learn so much of, of that mystery that when we don't have any relationship to it at all, all we can do is think the worst case scenario about it, right? Um, and fear it because we don't know it. But if we have opportunity to come closer to it at any degree, it allows for an opening to another option that we didn't know about that is only present for us when we engage with it more. And so, whether it's the process of preparing by considering, you know, your legacy or your physical concerns and what's going to happen with my remains or thinking about regrets and guilt and all of those things. Um, or if it's that you feel called to maybe be closer to a person who is in the process of dying. Um, these are all ways that open up our capacity for 
appreciation and acceptance and understanding um, and a capacity for opening our hearts in ways that we didn't even know were possible. And so this is why I do the work that I do because it feels to me that it's the most honest and the most real and it's the one thing that we all have in common. It's the one thing that makes us all equal regardless of what trajectory our life has taken. Um, this is the foundation of being human. And when we talk about end of life and preparing for a thoughtful death, um, we are leaving everything aside and, and being together in the vulnerability that it is to be human. Um, and so I think with that, I am, um, I think I've, I've um, done the overview. And so um, Lydia, let me know if there's something else in particular that needs expanding if we want to go over our presenters for next week in more detail. Yes, yes. There, there is one, there's one question about an advanced directive, oh. lawyer or notario. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, advanced directives have to be uh, submitted to the state of Guanajuato by a notario. They can be written up by an attorney, an abogado, but in order to be a legal document, they have to be registered with the state of Guanajuato. The notarios are the only agents who are licensed um, to do that. So you can go to an abrogado and have it done, but you still have to pay for the notario. I would suggest um, that you really check with um, people that you know about it. I attempted to get an advanced directive done um, from a notario that came recommended to me, and it was horrible. It was a joke. I mean, I could have written it better myself. And it was gonna be something like 300 or $350, even in the month of September when they do the discount on wills. And I just said, well, this is ridiculous. I'm not, I'm not doing this. So we do have some recommendations um, from the UU community, from people that we have used, that we have been happy with about um, developing advanced directive and other legal documents that are associated with that process. Um, I didn't, I, I hadn't an, anticipated on having an attorney address this group because as you all know, there are a couple of um, non-NGOs, uh, nonprofits that regularly do seminars on these topics. They usually have them at the, uh, con the convention center, um, the one there on, right across from Luna de Queso. And they have attorneys and they have, you know, all of these legal people. So I, I didn't really want to set the time aside for that, for this group. However, if people are sufficiently interested, we certainly can do that. Well, I think what's, interest, what's important about doing an advanced directive is first of all, you have to um, research and and, and look at all of the possible things to consider. You know, the attorney is not gonna guide you through what your wishes are going to be. You know, the first and most, you know, significant work is going to be you researching and asking yourself all the questions, considering all of the possibilities of what could happen. I mean, thinking about, well, if I get to this point, but not this point, what would that be like? And if I get to that point and not that point, in, you know, in the decay of my capacities, then what? And, you know, it's really a, a really deep process that maybe you want some support with um, because we can't think of all of the possibilities. So informing yourself first, doing research on what are the possible um, conditions that you need to really consider, all of the different possibilities. Then once you have a clear picture of what your wishes are, then you just go to a notary. The notary is going to do for you just putting it into a format and, and getting it translated into legal and then doing all of that, that process. Um, yeah, I think there are, yeah, so, there are uh, many. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, but what I'm, I want to emphasize that the more important work to do is that you really deeply think about all of your preferences, in, you know, ahead of time. Um, and then there's, a, you know, we also need to consider what is our motivation? 
when we are thinking about putting all of these documents together. Uh, and this is part of the thoughtful, preparing for a thoughtful death process. Because we, you know, our first thinking, as I said before, and this is my thinking as well, is okay, practical things. What's gonna happen to my stuff? What's gonna happen to my body? But there's so much more to it. When we want to have advanced directives, for most of us, our motivation is that we are afraid of not having control. And we need to look at that. We need to look at our fear of not having control. And we need to look at why do I not want to be a burden for others? You know, often we're like, oh, I don't want to be around the moment I become a burden for others. You know, look at those things. Look at what is the motivation behind wanting to have all of these things, you know, all your ducks in a row. Because I, I'm just going to offer the perspective that, um, it's important and of course very responsible to do that but i also want to encourage you to look at the other deeper uh issues that are coming up when we do these things you know there is a real possibility that your wishes will not be honored for one reason or another we don't know the truth is about life that we don't know and so we can have that we can have a plan in the same way that we have a birth plan right somebody's pregnant they go and work with their midwife and they have a birth plan all of a sudden, the moment when, when labor comes, it's who knows what happened to the birth plan. Maybe we can do three things out of the birth plan, right? So in the same way, we have to be realistic and we have to work with the underlying motivation because that's what really needs to be addressed. Can I be okay with my wishes not being, even though I know what they are, not being honored? I don't, I don't want this to be the case, but I need to be prepared for that. And so this is where we talk about being prepared for a thoughtful death. So we want to think about what we can control, what is tangible, but we need to also consider that we have to be prepared to abandon all preparation, especially when it comes to end of life. And I just, you know, wanted to say that. And I, I have to say that in my experience, the one thing that is most guaranteed that will be as you wish is how your remains are handled. You know, everything else is, we can have a guide, we can have an intention and life takes over and death takes over. And these are the kinds of things that maybe we don't want to think about because they make us uncomfortable. Um, and this is what part of this is inviting us all to do is to explore those uncomfortable places. Mm -hmm. Okay, Wilka, can I go now? Yes, please. Okay, um, there are many resources online for information on all kinds of advanced directives. There are, um, and we are going to come up with a list of websites um, that are particularly helpful with providing forms and information. There's one called Exit International. Um, there's another one that's been around for a long time, the Hemlock Society. Um, many, uh, Many, uh, most um, advanced directives are um, qualified only for a particular state, but you can find some, like if you go to California, what they're gonna have is much different from what they might have in Idaho or Nevada. But you can go and look at, look at those forms and they, they, um, they address varying aspects of advanced directives, such as if you're a healthy person and you don't have any pre-existing conditions, However, what if you develop Alzheimer's? I mean, there are many levels of Alzheimer's. Do you want to be put on life support? Do you want to? And I've been working on this for myself personally for many years. Um, and I know that by going online, you could just do a search on advanced directives and you will find an incredible amount of information there that will be very helpful for you. Additionally, Wendy, our speaker for next week, is very experienced with advanced director, direct, um, advanced directive. She will know a lot about it. And our speaker for the following week, Dr. Pepe Valencia, who works in um, phenology, which is more or less assisted dying. He has a lot of experience working with people here, specifically in San Miguel. And he has got a um, process 
for if you do not want to be resuscitated, for me, I'm like, I don't want to be resuscitated. Don't put me on life support. Don't do anything. Well, how do we ensure that happens? As Wilka mentioned, if the ambulance comes and, pick you, and picks you up, they're going to do everything they can do. Even if you are a breath away from death, they will do whatever they can to keep you alive. Well, I don't want that in my situation. If I'm a breath away from death, or I'm going to be a vegetable for as long as they can keep me alive, let me die. And um, I have worked with Dr. Pepe and with my own personal physician, Dr. Chris Hatlestad, to make it very clear to both of them that these are my wishes. There are documents, and this is one thing that can go, that you can work with um, probably your attorney, not the notario, because they kind of function at a different level, but to make sure you have those documents in your attorney's file in your own file at home on top of your refrigerator and in the hands of all of your loved ones, which will give you a much better chance of the wishes from your advanced directive of being followed. So go online, Google advanced directive. There are many places you can get information. Um, Wendy next week will have more information about that because it's a topic of great, great concern for most of us. And then um, Dr. Pepe, the week after that, this is also something which he has a tremendous amount of hands-on knowledge about here in San Miguel. So if you start doing your research now, by next week, you'll know a little bit more to ask questions, and then we'll have Pepe after that. So it's, we can beat this topic. Um, I hate to say that. There's, there's we can, be, we can beat the topic to death. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's a couple of questions. And I want to add that um, you know, while in the States uh, and Canada, we may have, you know, bracelets and pendants and, you know, things that will tell what our uh, wishes are, you know, we could even have a tattoo on our, for on our forehead, on our chest that says, do not resuscitate, uh, do not call 911. None of those things will be honored in Mexico. Um, and so it's important to, to realize that, that we need to have everyone informed as, as Lydia Jane is saying, and that if we're, you know, if, I mean, it might seem ridiculous, but carry your advanced directives uh, document with you. Um, and so I'm just gonna answer a couple of questions that are here. So we have to have uh, an advanced directive in Spanish and it needs to be uh, legalized in Mexico. We cannot use the one from the States. And somebody else made a comment here that, some people change their minds as things change. And, you know, this is very true as well. So this is something that needs to be revised on a regular basis. Like you need to reconsider all of the questions. So even if you have an advanced directives in English that you made five years ago, you should look at it and reconsider what is on there and again, revise it to how you feel today. Um, you know, I have a story of a very quick story of somebody who was in the Hemlock Society. And when it was her turn that she was, um, uh, you know, it her, was her turn to, to work with someone who had terminal cancer and was in her final stages. She went to sort of discuss this with the woman and the woman said, actually, I don't want to do that anymore. She said, you know, the level of pain that I'm experiencing is giving me the, the deepest and most like exhilarating spiritual experiences I've ever had in my life. I just want to, I just want to have this experience. And she totally backed out of the whole plan. Um, so, so, you know, this is an extreme and beautiful case, but, but we all have to make room for changing our minds and for being flexible with what is happening. So this is why this work is not just about the final days. This is a work that can begin right now today and that we can continue to evolve with over the years that we have left. So let's see. Um, so yes, a doula can help. Uh, with with advanced directives, uh, a doula will probably be also, as I am, concerned with exploring everything else beyond it, not just the, the actual literal things of it, but how we feel about all of those things and why would we make those choices and to really go deeply into the whole experience and not just putting a few things down on paper. But yes, a doula can help with that and our team of the foundation can help with that. Um, and then, uh, the, would the presence of a, of a doula ensure that our wishes are honored? A doula definitely, and you know, an advocate, so you know, somebody like Wendy as well, um, it is our 
our, our role to defend your wishes. Um, the thing is, how do we make sure that whatever conditions you're in, in the moment that something is needed, that we are contacted? You know, if it's something that we can plan in advance, we will definitely be there. But how can we assure that we can support you and advocate for you when you're at the beach and we're here? So we have to think about these things too. We have to not just think, oh, I have it on a piece of paper, so it's all set. We have to think about the fact that you may be visiting your family in the States when this happens, and then what? So, so this is why what Lydia Jane said, that we have to make, you know, this is another thing, we have to have our conversations with our family members and our loved ones, and or our trusted friends who are our go-to people, so that everybody is aware. And the more people who are aware, the better. Like, even your, you know, your gardener and your house helper, they need to be aware of it too, because they could be the person who is there. Um, so this really shifts the way that we think about having our relationship with, with our death, right? Our mortality. And I'm, I'm going to jump in here for a quick moment. Um, sure. Because I started working on this process for myself um, four or five years ago. I have made it a habit that once a year, and I generally do it at the end of the year, which, I mean, the middle of the summer, you know, might be easier for people. But at that point in time, I pull out, I have my documents, and it, this includes the emergency information document that you, you from the care team sent out, made available to people. It includes that information, it includes my advanced directive, it includes all of my, uh, you know, my important contacts. Once a year, I look at that. And every year it astonishes me how, many, how much things have changed. You know, my, who do we contact? And, you know, people come, people go, people die, doctors come, doctors go. Every single year I look at it and I go, Lord, you know, I gotta, I mean, I don't have to completely rewrite it, but it is so substantially different from the year before that if I don't do it every year, you know, when my gardener comes and, you know, file, finds me keeling over, over the daisies, it's gonna be like, well, this phone number is no good anymore. Well, she died last year. Well, you know, this person won't even talk, you know? So in terms of do things change? Yes, absolutely. They change a lot. And it is a very sound practice to force yourself once a year to just go through that file and take a look and see what you need to update. Mm -hmm. You got any more questions? Is the Mexican directive accepted in the US? No, I'm sure it's not. The advanced directives are state by state. It's got to be signed out and filled and notarized in the state in which you live. Uh, maybe live or, I mean, if you don't live in California, but you have relatives there and if that's where you think you're going to die, if you're not in San Miguel, then it would be a good idea to file one in that state, but they are state by state. And you'll find that when you go online and look, there'll be information and, and uh, examples of forms from many different states and they're all a little bit different. Anything else? So, Wilka, would you like to talk a little bit more about the speakers who are coming up? I know Wilk, uh, Wendy was sitting in today, so I think she's got a good idea about the topics that she's a subject matter expert in, um, but just give some background on our upcoming speakers so people can be getting ready to think about what they want to talk to them about. Yeah, um, well, I don't have memorized the bios, um, but Wendy, who is uh, coming to join us from uh, Ahihik or Lake Chapala, uh, right? Yes. Uh, um, yeah. She has tons of experience with uh, advocacy and accompaniment in dying and, uh, you know, palliative care. She's a great advocate of all of these issues and she is very, very knowledgeable around uh, all of the legal details of dying in Mexico in her state. Um, and so she's a great resource. I mean, she's an invaluable resource to all of us um, and a great inspiration to me. Um, so she will be talking next week about her experiences with um, Lydia Jane will be doing an interview. And so we will learn about her um, life stories with this kind of work. And it includes some of the 
physical and social and emotional and spiritual aspects of, of this process. Yes. Specifically about dying in Mexico. Um, and then we're going to have Dr. Pepe Valencia, who um, is uh, one of our uh, big uh, doctors in, of, of geri ger gerontology and hospice care in Mexico. And um, he's the vice president of the foundation. And uh, he has, of course, also a lot of experience, over 40 years of experience with end of life. Um, and he also has developed amazing programs for uh, elders in our communities. Um, beautiful programs uh, sort of to validate the third age, if you're familiar in, in Mexico, that, that third uh, part of life um, and bringing that back into our societies. He even started the uh, Fil Abuelos, which is the, the festival for for literature and books for people who have written books who are over 60 because we have like the regular book fair and then we have the children's book fair so he created and has uh, spearheaded the the book fair for um, the third age um, and so he'll be talking about his experiences about um, you know conscious dying I would say within the, the medical context and then we have Carlos Chancellor, who is also, he's part of the advisory board. I'm sorry, that's not true. He's actually a spokesperson for the foundation and he's part of the advisory board as well. Um, but he is uh, one of our uh, board members. And he um, is a Jungian psychoanalyst and he works with story and myth. Um, and he will be talking about the sacred space that we enter into in the process of grief and dying. Um, and that's a really, as I said before, for lack of better terms, it's this very mystical place that, that we all have a chance to be a part of and that we all have a lot to learn from. And then we have uh, Felicitas. Felicitas. I'm yes. sorry? Felicitas. Yeah, Felicitas uh, Kush Lango. She uh, is a member of our community for part of the, the every year, for part of the year. And she is in our, the advisory board of the foundation. And she's currently in Buffalo, and she's doing this really incredible research on the impact of our end-of-life decisions uh, for future generations. And so this is really something that is, I think, very important for us to consider, that it's not just about where we end. It's also about what begins beyond our end. Um, and so she'll be talking about that. And then we have Andrea uh, Kaufman, who will be talking about legacy um and uh we might then continue the series um i would love to talk to you about green burial and home funerals and all of these things and there is a green burial project that is be being started by the foundation um in this region so i'm very excited to um, share that with you in the near future and we may align line up more people for example we have somebody who is a um, uh, a, how do you call it? She, she dedicates to uh, organizing your life. And so we can look at how do we declutter our lives, uh, both physically and emotionally, to prepare for end of life. Because one of the things that all of us are concerned with is what's going to happen to all my stuff. Um, and so we may have uh, the opportunity to have her speak with us about how do we tackle that, um, especially if we're the kind of person who. Um, you know, has a lot, has a yeah, and let, let me let me jump in there just for a yeah. just uh, real quickly. I was um, the, I get uh, newsletters from very uh, like Exit International and um, you know the societies because there are many of them, and one of them jumped out at me because it's about a Swedish and look if you can remember the name of this because I I don't remember it but the Swedish have a specific. Okay protocol called death cleaning uh -huh. it is about death decluttering uh -huh. and i'll tell you that just went off like a bell in my head in my head because i've got so much stuff around my house i'm like oh you know i want to get rid of this because i don't want people to have to come in and take care of it for me and i don't need it and somebody else could use it and i thought boy wouldn't it be really great to have someone in you know the swedish have that hoogie you know the thing that's so popular right now about comfort home and then they've also got this very specific topic of and there are people who function and it is not simply around decluttering it is around decluttering for death 
Yes. So it's not, I'm moving to a smaller apartment, but I want, it's like, no, you know, I'm going to be dying sometime soon. So I really, what do I need to give to my kids? What do I need to, you know, get, you know, if I really want to, so that when I die, I'm not leaving behind this huge mess for somebody else to come in and, and, um, and I think it's a lot of, you know, many of us, we know this stuff. It's not rocket science, but to have someone presented in a way that, okay, you know, here's how we've developed a protocol for how to do that. And I thought it would be very interesting to have somebody come and talk to us about that. I, we might not get somebody from Sweden, although doing Zoom, we certainly could, but yeah. Wilka knows someone who's a professional in the field that we're gonna be talking to to see if she can present to us at some point in time. So get your brooms ready. <laughs> and I, th I think that's all the speakers we have lined up right now, Wilka. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we are at 1125, so let me give this a little wrap. Um, first of all, please do make your donations if you have not done that already. Um, Diana has posted several times in the chat list, so all you have to do is click on the link. Um, we would very much appreciate hearing your feedback on today's session. I know that some of you seem to have technical difficulties, but there's not really anything we can do about that. You know, we're sending it out over our UU network that we use for our Sunday services. So if you had a bad connection or something that could be on your end, we can't really do anything about that. But if you have other, um, either positive comments about what you appreciated or can let us know what you think we could do better, we would appreciate that. If you have any specific future topics that you would like us to address, someone said, will there be an attorney? Um, you know, if five or six or seven or eight people say we'd like an attorney, then I will certainly make more of an effort. If you'd like to hear more about green funerals or um, I, I, there are so many new trends um, in the funeral world other than embalming and, you know, digging a pit in a, in a beautiful landscaped um, cemetery somewhere or cremation, there are so, there's so much going on in that that I, I think that would be a really interesting topic to hear people who are the most relevant about what's going on with that. But if you have any other future topics that you'd like for us to, to think about, um, please give us your feedback on that. And um, I'd like to mention this has become, I mean, I just got this idea today during the workshop. Um, our UU community is, has got, at the present time, I think three discussion groups. Um, two of them are of a very general nature, and one of them is more specific for people who live alone. As I continue to delve into this topic of a thoughtful death, more and more uh, speakers and um, topics of interest come up for me. Um, and I, am, I would like to hear from you if you think it would be worthwhile for us to set this up as either a weekly or bi-weekly discussion group specifically focused on preparing for a thoughtful death. Mm -hmm. um, are there en enough topics that would be of interest? And do we, all, do we have enough personal experience, you know, of what happened when, you know, let me tell you what happened when my mom died. You know, let me tell you when, you know, somebody died in a car wreck and that we could all learn from that. I think it probably in some ways would be similar to um, Wilka's Death Cafe, but not exactly the same. But that would be, um, yeah, that, that would be set up on an ongoing basis to kind of keep this subject going until we're out of isolation and we don't want to talk about it anymore. You know, we're done. You know, let's go to Rio de Janeiro and not think about death. Um, or it could be more of an ongoing. So in your feedback, in, in your final responses, if you could give us feedback on today, if you have any specific topics you would like to see us address, and if you think that setting up a, a, a discussion group um, would be of value and something to think about doing after we finish with these speakers we've already set up, I'd really appreciate it. So thank you very much, and don't forget um, that you will get an email from Diana next week with the link to next week's speaker, Wendy. Um, and you don't have to register and you won't have to register again unless we set up a discussion group, which we probably would want registration for. And um, I thought it was very informative. I enjoyed it. I'm glad we had such a good group. 
Thank you so Anything much. Anything else here? Anything else here? I think this is all good. Okay, so we'll leave the we'll leave the chat, um, Diane. If we can leave the chat open for a while, so people have time to give and uh, put in their feedback, then that'll be good. And uh, look forward to seeing you next week. All right. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.